Good afternoon. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our Thought Leaders series, Engineering the Olympics, Transport and Accessibility. My name is Amanda and I'll be your host for today. Firstly, in keeping with our custom, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them, their cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the partners of the Engineering in the Olympic series, AMAG, Arup, Oricon, GHD, Cardno, Nastantec and SMEC. I would like to thank SMEC for partnering today's event, focusing on transport and accessibility. Today, we will hear from two speakers, followed by our live audience Q&A, and I encourage you all to send through questions by the chat box. And I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Nick Morris. Nick is a recognised expert in accessibility, having consulted in the field of universal design and accessibility for over 20 years, in parallel to being a member of the Rollers Gold Medal team from Atlanta in 1996. Nick created Morris Godding Access Consulting. The combination of both sporting and business experiences elevated Nick to become an expert consultant to the International Paralympic Committee for over 10 years, culminating in winning the silver medal for event services at the Rushman's Events Awards in London. Please welcome Nick Morris. Um, thanks very much for that introduction. And um, yeah, I'm really wrapped to be here today to talk about engineering the Olympics and Paralympics, transport and accessibility. So my journey started about 35 years ago. I was a normal country kid from Wangaratta, loved footy and cricket. And then one day I decided to jump on a motorbike with a uh, few other guys. There was a guy on the front with a helmet on, a guy in the middle without a helmet on, and myself on the back with a helmet on. Anyway, we were riding for about five kilometres at night and unfortunately the light went out on the bike and instead of taking this slight bend, we went straight ahead and hit a tree. Um, guy on the front got a broken ankle, guy in the middle got a ruptured spleen and I got seven broken ribs, three shattered vertebrae, two punctured lung, a bruised kidney and a fractured skull. Thus started my journey on accessibility that's taken me right around the world. And really, this presentation is a culmination of my experiences and, and culture development that really uh, I want to impart with a lot of people, particularly leading towards 2032. So, as once crippled, I've been handicapped, disabled, physically challenged, impaired, accessible. Now I'm universal and sustainable. So, at the end of the day, when do I become normal? Now, ask my friends and family, that's never going to happen. But if you look at the, the photos, one day I'm in Zap Power, I'm a school production in Superman. The next moment my mum's looking over my bed wondering whether I'll make it through the night. And then in 1996, we play in the Paralympics in Atlanta and uh, we beat the Americans in the semi-final in front of 10,000 screaming Americans. And then not to be outdone, we decide to beat Great Britain in the final to win Australia's first ever gold medal in basketball. And um, that was me being a little bit happy at the end of the, uh, at the end of the result. So let's get a couple of things really off the top. Let's talk about terminology. You know, it is the Olympics and the Paralympics. It's the games, it's a collective. It's a huge festival that generally runs for about 60 days in, in the host city in Brisbane. And I'm an elite athlete with disability. Wait, let me correct that. I used to be an elite athlete with disability. Now I'm a broken old man with uh, who uh, loves playing lawn bowls. Anyway, that's another story. We do sport and uh, Paralympic sport is collectively called para sport. So if you're wondering what to call it, it's just para sport. Whether it's wheelchair rugby, it's truck cycling, it's whatever it is. If it's done with elite athletes with disabilities, we generally call it para sport. And then we talk about people with accessibility needs. I, I really don't like talking about disability. I want to talk about accessibility needs because people have an accessibility need, whether I'm in a wheelchair, 
you're a mum or a dad with two kids in a stroller or or you've got fatigue or whatever those things are. And so everyone has an accessibility need and, and the, the terminology and everything's changing. We're now talking about all gender accessible toilets or maybe just an accessible toilet. Um, so the terminology is changing. And once again, when we're talking operations and we're talking development of the games, we talk about accessible infrastructure. We talk about what accessible wayfinding, operations, comms, emergency evacuation and transport. It's all accessibility. And the reason I say that is because you talk, look at uh, Michael Milton on the left-hand side of that screen. He's a one-legged skier who just decided that he wanted to make, become the fastest skier in the world, one leg or other. He didn't quite get the fastest skier in the world. He got the fastest Australian, either on two legs or one legs, to do 213 kilometres an hour. Just under him is where I want to take it. I would love at the Brisbane Olympics and Paralympics that we started using the pictogram on the right-hand side. It's dynamic. It shows what's going on. And, and really, it makes me go from what looks like a painting on a floor of a, a car park to being on a sign that really shows um, people being dynamic. So let's talk about the Paralympics. So 24th of August to the 5th of September, roughly 4,500 athletes for 164 countries, give or take, heaps of events in 20 sports. There'll be 10,000 media, three villages. I reckon that we will break 2.5 million tickets sold for the Paralympics. And let me just fill you in on how Olympics can change the world. I was invited to go and work in the Beijing Olympics. And all of a sudden they're saying, they're saying to me, well, how can we demonstrate accessibility? I said, you've got to make the Great Wall of China accessible. And they said, okay, well, that's it's two and a half thousand kilometres of wall, so that's a bit hard. We went out to a place called Battling. I saw a guy with a wheelbarrow who was wheeling up and down this pathway getting up to the, uh, and he was doing maintenance on the, on the Great Wall. And I said, that's where we're going to make it accessible. So a year and a half later, the Great Wall of China was accessible. But my point is that once you get to the top of the Great Wall of China and you're in a wheelchair, you can only go 20 metres that way and 20 metres that way. But it's, that's not what it's about. It's about being able to get up there and on any given day be able to look in 50 kilometres that direction and see how amazing the wall goes off and 50 kilometres in the other direction. So it's about a game's experience. And as you can see with that photo, there's two of my Chinese um, colleagues who were really just wrapped to be able to get up there and feel part of the whole experience. And just while we're talking about the bottom photo is a really interesting one. So when we talk logistics, you've got to be careful what mechanism you use. As you can see, that this is a stair climber. It takes approximately two minutes to go up, 30 seconds to get off, and another two minutes to go down. So roughly, give or take five minutes. There are about eight people there that wrap around the corner, eight fives of 40. It takes 40 minutes to get all of those people up those stairs. So you've got to be careful what mechanism you choose because you know what? You may not be able to get everyone up and the game's experience will be really ordinary. So accessibility needs. There's a complete list there. Everything from, from um, fa young families to drug and alcohol, large and short statured people. The one I want to focus on is fatigue. In the Olympic Games, at the end of the day, at the end with the Olympics, basically at four o'clock in the afternoon, you get a lot of people who have either not drunk enough water, they've been in the sun, or quite simply, they probably haven't walked that distance um, in the last two years. And all of a sudden, they want a shuttle bus, they want uh, shade and shelter, they want all those things that, that basically allow them to to move through the uh, the building or the, the precinct better than what they did first thing in the morning. So, and when it all boils down to it, these are people with accessibility needs. No disability, nothing like that. So we really broaden the description. So the Disability Discrimination Act is a federal legislation in Australia. 
There's also the Disability Standards on Accessible Public Transport, which is referenced under the Disability Discrimination Act. Then we have the Australian Standards and we have the Building Codes of Australia. They're the technical requirements that we need to build facilities to. But if you want to know if you've complied or not, then you look at the principles of the DDA. We've got seamlessness, predictability, consistent or weather. All of these things are actually good standard building practices. So it should be no surprise on the DDA that these are just simple things because as a person who uses a wheelchair, that's all I need is simple things. And the same with universal design. Is universal design is now just really looking at the holistic environment and saying, you know what, maybe we should put an accessible toilet into the manager's office or the back of house so that we can actually also use the shower and maybe put a first aid kit in there and maybe even put some, put some lockers so it becomes universal. Um, and it's really interesting, my mate Dylan Alcott, who, you know, he's taken accessibility to the next level and he's now commercial. He's sponsored by ANZ and gets an egg sandwich whenever he wants and he's got his own pair of Nikes that have been designed for him. The guy doesn't even walk, but he's got his own Nikes. But he is taking it to the next level and really challenging people to, to explore their feelings and challenging people like myself to say, well, okay, get amongst it, demand um, greater experiences so that people and uh, organisations actually are forced to deliver them. So the key principles, and once again, the signage there is all about non-gender or gender neutral or universal, all these different terms that we're now looking at. But the reality is, with accessibility and wellness, you look at the different types of descriptions we put to the built environment. Placemaking, human-centered design, inclusion, diversity, all these things, at the end of the day, it is all about accessibility and making sure that the whole community is encompassed. And then when you look at the features that we're now putting in, none of which, I might add, are under the building codes. So parents' rooms, multi-faith rooms, sensory rooms, all of those areas are things that allow people to come to an event or to a building and feel comfortable um, being able to, to um, be facilitated in that building. And one of the big ways that I would like to demonstrate universal design is in a very, very simple way. It's just a playground. I am. It's the first time in 35 years I've been able to jump on something with my kids oh, no, and be able to play. Admittedly, they are trying to make me sick. Um, they just wanted to spin the crap out of me, which is not great. But when you look at that, it's got colour and contrast. There is no steps. There's no wood chips. It's easy to get on and off. And for me, as a parent, to actually play with my kids is really simple, really simple. So let's talk about the spectator experience. So when you come to a games, it is not just about the games. It's not just about the, the, um, the competition. It is so much more than that. Unfortunately, with COVID in, in Tokyo, no one could experience that. But Sydney 2000 experienced a massive growth of people travelling. And if you look at that, there's a heap of Japanese tourists heading up to Uluru. And I know myself, when I, where, whenever I went internationally, I was always travelling to their major tourist attraction. But if you look at this and you look at how the experience of getting around the city, it's very, very simple. Before I even get to the venue, I want to know what's going on. I want to know where the toilets are. I want to know which tickets I can buy and how much they are. And I want to experience all those elements. So athletes want to do it, the media want to do it, the locals want to do it, people from Australia want to do it and the international travellers want to do it. They want to experience the whole of Australia when the games are on and that is the real network. So let's talk about transport experience. You know, once again, it's very simple, some of the things that we want and these once again are simple um, journey um, requirements that we want. Things like a journey planner, park and rides with accessible parking, low floor buses that link to it, um, rest seating, undercover areas, you know, 
Commonwealth Games up on the Gold Coast, we had the connection between the heavy rail, the light rail, and drop-offs, and it worked really well, but we had to plan it. And this is a concept that everyone will get used to, which is the last mile, which is where there is no transport. It's literally pedestrian pathways walking from the last piece of the um, transport infrastructure to the security lineups to get in the venue. And don't forget, people can often line up for about two hours waiting to get into a venue because of the security scanning protocols. Hostile vehicle mitigation is making sure that and when we do these things, that we allow enough space for pathways and, and people to move through those, those hostile vehicle mitigations. The simple toilets on our journey, at train stations, at drop-offs, at park and rides, all of these areas to make sure that people who might have travelled for four or five hours have that amenity. And something that's really, it often drops off, which is, just emergency evacuation, but accessibility focused. Do we have an evacuation strategy when things go wrong? Quite often the answer is no. Um, and just on the experience, if you could look at this, uh, um, pardon me, <coughs> screenshot on the left, that's how people who are non-verbal are able to communicate with transport staff, is making sure that potentially we have a number of those available that we can give to people so that they can communicate with staff. So let's talk infrastructure. Drop us with curb ramps or seamless. The reason we need sometimes portable curb ramps is because we have low floor buses and if you don't have a curb ramp, it means you've, you've got to lower the bus as low as you can to try and get the ramp at the right angle. Whereas if you have a curb ramp, bus pulls up, the ramp's on a reasonable gradient, you can get in and get out pretty quickly. Um, Accessible pathways and doors that are light operating, building lines that, are, that have clear building lines so you can move in a linear direction. Tactile indicators, well, in a lot of events, we just don't use tactile indicators because we can't install it there um, in, a, in a way that's integral to their, to their installation to make sure they don't pop up. And what we find is that the, with mass movement of people, to follow a tactile indicator is, is not held impossible. And things like ticket scanners, using ticket scanners rather than using turnstiles so that we can get people through and we don't have to worry about turnstiles. But what happens then is when the event's finished, people can come out the other way and not have to worry about pushing open the gates on turnstiles. And things like food and beverage and loading points. And you can see the humble rest seat is often overlooked. And we, we try and guarantee that every 50 metres you have accessible seating in some shape or form. And now with rail, where if we can't get the height between the platform and the, and the um, rolling stock, sometimes we have to show a loading ramp that really assists people getting on and off without having to pull out a portable ramp by the driver. Operations. Employment of people with accessibility needs, straight off the top, that we've got 10 years to get people with lived experience who can actually become part of the design process and actually work for the organisation. Development of policies and procedures that make sure that we're really confident in our service delivery. That if we can't provide every train or tram um, as being accessible, what's our policy on that? Is it one every second one? Is it one every fourth one? How, what level of, of operation are we going to provide? Um, same with, same with Travellers Aid. Travellers Aid is an amazing organisation, particularly in Melbourne, but they're, they're in other states where people can go and hire a scooter for the day who are elderly so they can actually use it on public transport. And all of a sudden, they're one less person that we're trying to get into a uh, um, first aid because they want a, a, uh, a manual wheelchair to push around. But they actually arrive at the event ready to enjoy their day. And really, the transport links between providers. And the last one, second last one, is a really interesting one. Tourism and civic accessibility features is that we develop this games network of how to get to the venues. But if you want to get from the venues to a tourist attraction, quite often that network is broken so that we don't actually have a transport network. It's part of the game system that gets me from a live site to a tourist attraction. So that's something that we can obviously do better. And lastly, 
the old style uh, speaker at the um, at the train station. We're now talking about people with hearing impairments and hard of hearing who use hearing augmentation. Is we start to use TVs, low level speakers with with cone speakers. That means that you can go and sit somewhere near a, uh, a TV. The speaker is really clear. It's not a big booming speaker from from four meters up that tries to cover the whole of the platform. It's something a bit more strategic that allows people to actually hear a lot better. Information. I don't have a problem if you tell me what's inaccessible. I prefer to know what's not accessible and that every third bus is not accessible. So I know that I can plan my trip and that's what it's all about. And some of these, some of these elements, staff training, customer service, the ticket boxes, contingencies, when things go wrong, who's doing the training and how do we, how do we communicate those, those things? Um, it's interesting. I recently did a review of Burnley train station in Melbourne. And on the website, I went and the first thing I did was went and had a look at what features it had on its website. And it sounded good. It had tactile indicators. It had uh, ramps. It had an accessible toilet and all these other things. The pathways hadn't been updated in probably about 30 years. The tactile indicators had worn out and they no longer existed. The edge of the platform was, was basically um, exposed. The ramps were about one in four. I couldn't push up them myself. And the accessible toilet was in the middle platform. How the hell do I get to it? So the reality of what was actually there versus what was portrayed on the website were two different things. I spend a lot of time talking about toilets. And, I, and the reason I do is because it is so vital. And when we're talking about engineering spaces, these are one of the most important things to ensure people are comfortable. Looking left to right, we've got the Changing Places facility. My mate who was uh, 45, he had a brain tumour, uh, sorry, a brain aneurysm, and all of a sudden he, he can walk two kilometres, but he can't remember his mother's name, he's incontinent, and he needs a, an adult change facility for his family to take him out. Then you have accessible toilets, some with showers, some without, some with first aid kits, some with baby change facilities. And then we have ambulant accessible toilets where people who have mobility impairments can use them. But if we make them as, as all gender, then anyone can use them. And the same with the, with the end bathroom, which basically has a shower, a toilet, and very much looks like the, um, the Paralympic Billy. And then we've got changing places. These are really purpose-built facilities to enable people of really high needs to be able to get in and enjoy a, 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 uh, an event with their family. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. There is so much good stuff out there. For example, right now, Indigenous tourism in Australia, and it's accessible. We know where they are. So all of a sudden we can start to promote what's accessible, link the operations to it, link the transport to it so that we can deliver that seamless service and the same with accessible tourism in Victoria. We're doing the same thing. If you want to put a value on it, Professor Simon Darcing from uh, UTS, he valued accessible tourism at roughly around eight to ten billion dollars worth of value. That's B with a billion. That is massive. It's almost as big, if not bigger, than the Chinese inbound market on tourism. So. What do, what do people like me do? We do accessibility audits. We can come on site and have a look. We're currently um, looking at doing some stuff with the Commonwealth Games in Victoria to, to see if we can look at all the potential venues and whether they have inherent accessibility requirements, how much overlay we might need to put on, whether we can invest and put permanent facilities in that develop a legacy. These are all the things that we'll be looking at and that we'll be looking at for Brisbane as well. Staff training, operations and education, just simple terminology so that when we're talking about elements, um, that we're really using the right language and keeping it nice and simple, develop principles and strategies. What, what are we aiming to achieve so that we can say that at the end of the day, we can develop a seamless and accessible network, but what is the level of expectation we're going to deliver? Design reviews, there's lots of technical elements out there that we need to comply to. 
whether it be through the National Construction Code and building surveyors where we've got to sign them off. And the same with performance solutions. What happens when we can't comply? What do we do then? And lastly, I help solve problems. Um, photo on the left hand side is a really interesting one. That was the Beijing Tennis Centre. And uh, we had the look and feel that was uh, obviously decreased the sight lines, which was not great. So, in summary, here's some thoughts. Somebody asked me about training one day for staff training, and I came to the conclusion that it had to be really simple. I'm an expert in my own accessibility. For example, if you want to push me up a step, don't push me, push my wheelchair, because if you push me, I go forward out of my wheelchair, but if you push my wheelchair, then we both go up the, up the uh, curve. And I can tell you from experience, it's not great getting pushed out of your wheelchair by someone who, who thought they were helping. Tell me where you want me to go. If the route is inaccessible, that's not a problem. Just tell me where the accessible route is, put signage on there using pictograms so that I've got safety of movement and predictability to know where I'm going. Once again, not English speaking, using pictograms, and they're changing all the time. Um, so the, let's make sure that the pictograms are really simple and that they give us good direction. And once again, seamless accessibility. It's amazing how many people, young families, myself, who need an accessible journey and break the journey down, bite-sized pieces so that we can make sure that at the end of the day, it's seamless. From the moment I leave my house until the moment I come back to my house. And once again, there are real commercial outcomes. I love this photo. Uh, the young boy or girl is just, her parents decided that uh, their legs were not going to stop them uh, running as fast as they can. And I really love that, especially leading to the Paralympics. So, <coughs> the aspiration and legacy at the Paralympics is massive. And I'll give you one example. I was wheeling through a shopping center in uh, 1998. Um, so the Paralympics was two years away and I'm wheeling through and all of a sudden I heard this little kid say to his mum, I wonder what sport I played. The world changed from him asking what was wrong with me to him associating sport with me. We now can aspire a generation. We've that, got that young kid on the left-hand side who maybe one day, in 10 years' time, it's a long time, can become Stuart Tripp, a gold medalist in the Paralympics in hand cycling. The challenge is out there, and um, look, I, I, I think it's amazing. I can't wait. We've got a Commonwealth Games in, in uh, 2026. We've got the Brisbane Olympics and Paralympics in 2032. And um, we've got a lot of engineers who have got a lot of work to do. And, and I love working with you guys because you're all practical, um, forward thinking people. So um, thanks for the opportunity to present. And um, yeah, any questions? Thank you, Nick, for a great presentation. And I'd like to welcome our second speaker, Tim Coopit. Tim is a transport planner with expertise in public transport planning and has developed high-level strategies in policy documents to operational public transport plans. Tim's key strength is his knowledge and understanding of not just the infrastructure and network planning elements of public transport, but the complexity and interactions of each component of the public transport system. Tim has delivered and supported business cases for public transport and road infrastructure projects under different assessment frameworks and gateway approval processes. Please join me in welcoming Tim Kupit. Thanks, Amanda, for that introduction. Um, I'll just launch into the presentation now. So, the presentation is titled The New Norm, Seamless Transport. Um, I'm just going to start off with a quote. So transport is civilization. So this quote comes from Kipling, a famous uh, novelist and poet, who wrote in one of his science fiction novels. While this quote by Kipling is almost 100 years old, it's still profoundly true today. It also reminds me of the importance of my job every day as a transport planner. Essentially, the world as we know it would not function without transport, whether it be facilitating global trade, 
carrying essential goods, providing access to essential services, educational opportunities, employment opportunities, and recreational activities. And just as transport is central to civilization, it's also central to the Olympics and Paralympic Games. As transport facilitates access to venues, athletes, media, spectators, and allows the continuous functioning of the host city, or in the case of the 2032 Olympics and Paralympics, the Southeast Queensland region. Transport and transport. On, on the theme of quotes at the moment, the former Premier of New South Wales, John Fay, uh, was famously quoted um, as saying transport and transport as being the most critical and challenging and uncertain aspects of any games. So you, you might remember John Fay, who's famously leaping for joy when the Sydney Olympics were announced as the as the winning city. So that that significant challenge in meeting those transport requirements has also been recognised by the uh, International Olympic Committee for hosting the games. So they understand that transport is one of the biggest contributors to the financial burden of games, and that it requires significant investment. In the case of Sydney, for example. It ended up costing 10 times the original estimates for the transport for spectators. So it just shows you the scale and um, the issues related to transport in the delivery of any games. In recognition of this significant financial burden on host cities or regions, um, the International Olympic Committee in 2018 released this document called the New Norm. So what, what this document did, it acknowledged how difficult and expensive the games were and looked at how they could streamline operations to minimize the financial burden and costs to hosts and more importantly looking at how they could unlock more value over the longer term so that, that's what's really interests me as a transport planner how, how do you unlock this um, value over long term particularly when transport being one of those major contributors to the costs and burdens of the cities so in that document, there's there's three key initiatives that they highlighted. So, one, candidature, two, legacy, and three, a seven-year journey together. So, even though legacy has been a long-recognised goal of the Olympics, it even featured even more in this this document, the new norm. The key focus was it was using the games as a catalyst to deliver on the long-term plans of the region. So, as as a transport planner, that makes me excited in Southeast Queensland because. It's not just throwing out all the previous planning that we've done. It's it's taking that and making sure the games syncs with that previous planning. So it's not creating a new plan, wiping the slate clean, but making sure we can have those assets and networks that uh, endure for generations to come. So some of the other key learnings that were identified by the IOC in this document were about having a seamless transport system for athletes, spectators and media. I'll, I'll get to what a definition of what seamless transport is because it's silent in the document about what that is. Other, other elements they highlighted were minimising usage of dedicated fleet and buses. So relying on the existing transport system as much as possible as opposed to having these overlays of additional services and infrastructure just specifically for the games. Looking at leveraging new technologies, for example, using tapping into autonomous vehicles and what they can do. Looking at how Technology can enable pooling and the sharing of solutions as well, and adopting a user pays model. So not just so this, this is a demand management model essentially having a user pays model. So everyone isn't just accessing all the transport services. Um, it reduces the demand on the network. The other one is having a greater reliance on public transport, which I find really interesting because most of my career has also been in the public transport industry. And I've always recognised that this is always going to be important to a games and essential, but it's good to see that the IOC has recognised this as, as a, a key element of good games as well. So the IOC has highlighted that in recent experience that host cities with efficient public transport systems are the most successful and less complex to deliver. In addition, the IOC has also suggested that the game stakeholders tend to prefer an efficient public transport system as opposed to having these specific games related transport services. So it's it's more about creating a system that can endure across generations and also, also support the games as well. So for example, in the London 2012 Olympics, the games planning didn't rely on major changes to the transport system to accommodate the games. 
they already had a mature and extremely well-developed public transport network. So they didn't need all these overlays of additional services and other things. Even uh, spectators were able to use the existing system in place. Well, the IOC's new norm is silent on what makes a seamless transport system. There is no, as I mentioned before, there's no definition of what that is. So what, what I really want to do today is actually have a look at what we see as forming a transport seamless system and what are the key elements we need to consider. And in specific in the context of public transport, given the, given the emphasis the IOC has given on the importance of public transport to a great games. So a seamless public transport system, what is it? Well, my definition is it's where there's any, where any physical, financial, of service provider operator ex exchanges within a journey, or indeed changes in virtual space, are completely imperceptible to the user. That's what a seamless journey is all about. They, they take a customer-focused approach, whether it be for athletes, officials, medias, spectators, visitors to the region, um, of, and residents of all abilities and ages. So whether it's your elderly grandmother, who can't navigate stairs, doesn't own a smartphone, a, a large family, number of kids, young kids, uh, a, 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 health, a bit healthy young couple who are you know, local residents and, and able to navigate the system, or you're from a non-English speaking background, they all need to have the same experience throughout the system and it needs to be seamless and easy as well. So in the case of our current network, my, my brother-in-law is a twice Paralympian, He's been to Rio and Tokyo, a silver medalist at the Commonwealth Games, is extremely a fit, although for him, public transport in southeast Queensland is still too difficult and complex to navigate. So taking it from his perspective, even as an athlete, um, and there needs to be a lot of improvements. So the network needs to also provide choice. It needs to be simple, legible, and flexible. It also needs to be physically and virtually integrated with coordinated transfers. There needs to be minimal delays, and ultimately what we need to work towards is having a zero wait state where there is any transfers or interchanges. So to deliver a seamless transport system that aligns with those long-term development goals of the region, so our long-term land use planning, our long-term strategic planning, we need to take an objective-led approach, or also known as a top-down approach, to developing the transport system. Traditionally, we've always taken a a bottom-up approach, or the, although there has been moves to move towards a top-down approach. This, these bottom-up approaches are very reactionary, um, focus on existing issues or problems in the system as well, but we don't necessarily always create the system we set out to establish. So the, the Games is a once-in-a-generational opportunity to actually create the system we want, the one that we're describing in our strategic documents. The fundamental to the system is accessibility. This is at the core of creating a great and seamless transport network as well. To, to deliver that, but we need to consider the access, accessibility it affords to individuals so that it provides people with access to education, employment, goods, services, and provides businesses with access to customers and a, a diverse labor pool as well. So this is the foundations of the seamless system and that we need to, we need to facilitate regional accessibility we also need to minimise the space in which we do it. So the most efficient way to do that is through public transport as well. So from a customer perspective, accessibility, what does that mean? Well, it's accessibility to the public transport system considering where it can get you. So what services we can access in a limited time period. For example, I've got an ice cream there on, on the screen there, which shows, so if you're at the Ridges Hotel in South Bank in eight o'clock in the morning, where can I get within 60 minutes travel time? So that takes into account walking, so, uh, walking to um, the train station as well at South Brisbane and where can we go? So that's, that's how I like to think about public transport as well and, the, and creating a seamless transport system. What, what can it offer you in terms of access? From the customer's perspective, a region and its transport system are defined by the arrival experience. This is partially about grand architecture, such as in the case of Grand Central Station in New York, um, if you've ever been there, it, which is a great arrival experience, it's a very impressive station. It's also about ensuring that those physical and financial entries to a system are imperceptible to, those, to the users or the customers. This is about how legible and easy a system is to understand 
And, and such as moves in southeast Queensland, such as adopting an account-based ticketing system with the Go Card, that that just tears down some of those barriers to entry. You don't no, no longer will need to have a, a proprietary smart card to enter the system. You'll be able to use your your foreign credit card to to move about the system. So reducing just barriers like that, making it easier when you first arrive and enter a system, are keys to having a a, a great seamless transport system not only just for, for the games, but also for generations to come. Changi Airport is an excellent example of some of the of, of great experience, arrival experience. It's a seamless experience and it's the product of the relentless pursuit of improvements with upgrades of new terminals passenger and passenger facilities of a high standard. Passion information is easy to understand no matter where you are or whatever your trip purpose is. In the terminal experience at Changi, it's also being considered from perspective of the end user or customer. And this concept is starting to be applied to the public transport sector. The end user is no longer a passenger, they are customers. So applying this, we'll say like a retail model, um, that considers the needs and experience of customers, whatever their profile as well, so whoever they are. So again, going back to those different user profiles, understanding what their requirements are and designing around those as well. So. In the transport system, we need to continually try to improve the customer experience. A key consideration for customers is how the region and networks are changing. Historically, we've had a monocentric region with a very dominant Brisbane CD, CBD supported by a radial monocentric public transport network. As the region becomes more polycentric as a, as a result of long-term development plans, which has encouraged decentralization and this creation of a centre's hierarchy, a network has to transition to a trunk and feeder network. While there's been changes and efforts moving towards this trunk and feeder network, there's going to be need to be further changes to support this future uh, polycentric region. As the system matures, connections and transfers become necessary and more important as well. Traditionally, customers have been reluctant to transfer, although with an increasing reliance on connections for a seamless transport system, there also needs to be an increased acceptance of transfers and connections, including between services and modes. Wayfinding and legible infrastructure and system branding, consistent liveries, directional signage, simple line structures in the network uh, are required. It's also about creating pleasant waiting environments, casual surveillance, and activity inter interchanges or or other transfer points or other activities so that we can move towards a zero weight state. So essentially where the perception of time is dramatically reduced. To ensure those improvements are targeted, it needs to be taken a data-driven approach to improving connections. For example, for trips to and from the Brisbane airport, pre, this is pre-COVID as well, Eagle Junction was one of the major transfer locations for public transport users in, in the region. Although the quality and standard of the station probably isn't, hasn't been a pleasant or legible experience. There is upgrades happening, but this is just an example of how we need to look at how users have or will be using the network so we can target all those improvements for connections and transfers to make sure that they are pleasant, seamless, no matter who you are. And improving the system, it's not just about providing new supply, which is what we have been traditionally focused on. It's been very much focused on adding new, new supply to the system, whereas we need to think about unlocking capacity in the existing system going forward and also managing the travel demand. While the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games demonstrate how su successful demand management could be, it needs, also needs to have a lasting impact so that our travel behaviours change for the good following the games as well, so it's not just dramatic impacts during the during the event. Well, in the future, we're going to have to leverage technology and exploit it. We shouldn't become distracted by technology. While personal drones and and other uh, evolving opportunities may play a role in the future, there is still a certain level of uncertainty how that will unfold. And it's not in the case of drones, it's not going to um, fulfill the transport tasks that we need to for games or or other major transport tasks in the future. Personal autonomous vehicles, well, they're more likely to be of hindrance and a help in the short to medium term as we have mixed fleets and the, and the infrastructure not necessarily, not 
necessarily ready to accommodate them. The greatest opportunity I see in technology is in autonomous public transport. So thinking things like the the Sydney Metro, the Vancouver Skytrain, for example. So having these autonomous transport services can remove some of the highest costs of operating those services, being labour costs for drivers. And what that can enable us to do is have services which are operating more frequently and for longer periods of time. We also need to exploit technology for the virtual integration and the dissemination of information. So using technology to facilitate the sharing economy, so whether that be shared modes of transport, whether it's carpooling, et cetera, but also for the integration of different modes. So we can have also a single payment system, such as mobility accounts, whether that's based on our existing ticking system as well. So whether you're taking Uber whether you're, or other rideshare services, public transport, paying for uh, retail items as well. So this is very much in line with mobility as a service and adopting that approach um, in the future. So we may be able to create a great transport system. We also need to make sure the destinations it takes us to are designed as places and spaces for people. Our destinations need to focus on the quality of their urban realm, which is so they are places where people want to be and enjoy. So this approach has been adopted in places such as South Bank in Brisbane, and it's a key reason for why it's been so successful. Measuring success. The ultimate measure of success, in my mind, is not that it was a great games, but rather, do we have a region that attracts people and businesses? Because growth is the key indicator of success. It's the success in the competition to attract investments and new residents to the region. That is ultimately what would be a great games, a legacy of a transport system, a seamless transport system that creates those economic opportunities for growth. So to support in the delivery of a seamless transport system, we take a customer-focused approach at SMEC as well. We do that whether it's in the strategic planning of transport networks, the design of infrastructure, or how we even operate our business in terms of looking after customers. We're also undertaking further research in the area as well. So talking to previous host cities and learning how they also created their seamless transport systems. So I invite everyone to get in contact and share their learnings and experiences and insights into creating seamless transport systems to ensure that the 2032 Olympics and Paralympics are a success as well. And we do have that enduring uh, legacy transport system for generations to come. So thank you, everyone, and I also invite any, any questions. Thank you to Nick and Tim for those two great presentations. Um, first up, apologies for the technical issues that we experienced at the start. And just in case you missed anything, we will be resending the link out this afternoon for everyone who registered for this event, which was well over a thousand people. I also want to welcome everyone who's watching via LinkedIn, which is a first for the Thought Leaders series. So welcome to our LinkedIn audience. And without any promotion, I'm pleased to say that we had around 250 viewers on that platform. So obviously we'll be using that again. Anyway, without further ado, it's now time for you to get involved. Uh, please, as always, send our speakers your questions via the chat box. And if you could nominate who your questions directed to. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions whilst registering, and we might begin with a couple of those. And on that note, um, just starting with you, Tim, um, we've had a question that's come in from Parthipan, who's based uh, in Victoria, asking you, um, Tim, it has been on the discussion connecting Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane with a super fast passenger train service. Numerous benefits on this project, not only the Olympic event, even after the Olympics. Um, do you know of any plans to actually execute this project? Tim. I, I'm not aware of any plans to execute this project. Um, there, there is plans in southeast Queensland that they're looking at improving the existing rail lines to improve the, um, increase the speed as well of those services. So they're calling it faster rail as well. But um, in terms of connecting Melbourne, Sydney um, and Brisbane um, with high speed rail, um, particularly in, in relation to the games, I'm not aware of any plans at the moment, but there has been business cases, has been investigated in the past. Um, but yeah, it, 
it, it would be uh, great to almost see some of that, that um, regional infrastructure improvements, um, particularly with rail. Thanks, Tim, for that. And over to you, Nick. We've had a question that's come in from Wayne, and Wayne's watching from Queensland. Good afternoon to you, asking, Nick, what are the provisions for emergency ev evacuation and how is this considered? <laughs> it's a great question. You know, um, in my mind, whether it's transport or buildings, you start off by looking, am I in imminent danger? And if the answer is no, then you're probably better off to stay put. Um, but we're looking in now at, at using um, horizontal evacuation to make sure that you can move away from an area into a, another zone or whether that be vertical integration with, with lifts and using potentially goods lifts and areas like that as refuges to, to move away. But what's more important is that we actually put an accessibility plan together so that you've got multiple options, but so that wardens and other people know exactly where people who can't use stairs need to get to. And it's generally they're the people with with the issues of people who are who cannot use stairs so develop a plan that is in line with the general evacuation plan specific to accessibility thank you thank you nick for that um tim we've had a question that's coming from marcella and marcella's um, watching from new south wales asking you what are the key infrastructure projects scheduled for the 2023 olympics uh, uh, I think that should be 2033 Olympics. Are there any metro lines in the pipeline? Jim. Yeah. Um, in terms of the infrastructure project schedule, I can't talk for the um, Queensland Department of Transport and Main Roads, but I would suggest referring to the, the bid document as well for the 2032 games. Obviously, there's going to be, you know, it's going to evolve, there's going to be more planning, because there's still some uncertainty around some venues as well. So there's going to have to be updates um, when there's better understanding of the transport task as well. So it's still, it's still early stages. Um, and there will still need to be improvements um, to the system, but also on the, uh, I guess, on the theme of legacy as well and aligning with uh, the existing planning for the region. It's also probably good to have a look at um, some of like the regional transport plans by TMR and also the Southeast Queensland Regional um, Plan as well, which kind of establishes, I guess, what, what planning for the future. And I guess what should ultimately see is something that aligns with those documents as well. So, um, Still in the planning, so yeah, it's not 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 one hundred percent sure how it all all un, unfolds, but that's that's the job over the next um, couple of years. And thanks for that. And just staying with you, Tim. We're you know we're getting a lot of questions through. Obviously, people are looking to try and get an understanding of what new infrastructure, transport in, infrastructure, the games will drive. And James, who is in Queensland, is asking you. Uh, will new rail lines be introduced to future proof and make these facilities reusable for other sporting events? Thanks, James. That's a great question. Tim. Uh, so, so similar to, I guess, the response to the last question, there, there is still some uncertainty there, but there is some, you know, major projects happening, like um, everyone's probably well aware of the Queensland government um, investing in Cross River Rail, so that will, you know, provide more capacity in the system, enable additional services, um, potentially new lines um, as well. Um, so, yeah, in, in terms of whether there'll be new lines, well, it's it's still in the planning as well. So, um, yeah, I can't answer again for the Department of Transport Main Roads as to as to whether there'll be new rail lines, but there's definitely um, investigations underway. Thanks very much for that. And Nick, bringing you back into the conversation, um, good afternoon to Rachel. Rachel's watching from Queensland asking you, what do you consider the priorities for improving accessibility for the Olympics and transport? Priorities, Nick. Great question. I mean, I think the simple things is that, unfortunately for a lot of stations, unless there are lifts installed, then they largely are inaccessible. And I think, We've got 10 years to highlight some of the key stations that are really pivotal to the operation and spending money and time to make them accessible so that 
as a legacy post the Olympics and Paralympics that at least other venues and hospitals or shopping areas are actually made accessible because of the Olympics. Um, and also linkages, like for example, drop-offs and having, having stations where we all know that driverless cars in the future are actually only probably 10 or 20 years away, is to make sure drop-offs and pickups are, are really well designed so that in the future, um, less of us are driving and more of us are being driven around. Thanks, Nick. And moving to buses, and Galan has is asking a question to you, Tim, asking, despite the train development in Brisbane, buses stay as a big part of transport around Brisbane, but buses can be very crowded quickly, late very easily, and not very disabled person friendly. Any solution to improve bus services? And I might start with you, Tim, and then Nick, if you also want to comment on this one. Uh, Tim. Yeah, um, yeah, they, they are the underdog or underappreciated aspect of the public transport system. The buses, they do the heavy lifting. They carry a big portion of, um, of the trips as well. But yes, they can become crowded on, on those popular lines as well. And they can be late. And, and yeah, I'll let Nick address some of the aspects about the being um, suitable for persons of all ages and abilities as well. But um, in, in terms of improving them, um, it, it does need to be speed and protection measures, particularly on those busy corridors and the most frequent ones as well, so they aren't running late as well. Um, crowding, you know, there's going to have to be increases in service frequencies as well. And again, this is all just part of the planning going forward as well. And even, even though we want a legacy system, as well. There will probably have to be service overlays um, to support the games because there'll be a, a significant spike, particularly in some locations, but um, that there will be need to be improvements and also to make buses more attractive as well, um, you know, just for, for the uninitiated. Yeah, and I sort of think from, from my point of view, I really challenge us to get technology whereby I can actually have on my smartphone what the capacity is of the next five buses that are coming along in real time. So that I could look at the next two buses and go, well, they're red, so I'm not going to make, make my time to get to them, but the next, next one's orange and the next two after that are green. So I can just go and sit under a tree for five minutes, wait for the two red buses to go past because they're full capacity, and then meander my way to the bus stop so that I can get the next two buses that are, have got green capacity. And that's something that we should be doing is having real-time transport updates so that I can choose which train I want to go on to, which um, bus I might want to go on to, so that it's all giving me the choice and the power to, that if I've got a young family that I'm, I'm happy to wait 10 minutes because that train or that bus is going to have the capacity where I don't have to be bustled around. Thanks for that. Thank you, guys, for, for that one. Uh, Tim, you talked a bit about legacy, um, the legacy of the games, which we've spoken about at the other webinars in this series and will continue to do so. And Kelly's asking you a question. What legacy from the games, um, the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games, would you like to see retained? Uh, there's, a, there's a few legacies um, I'd like to see retained. Um, one is probably um, the travel behaviour as well and the acceptance of public transport. See, um, at now um, there's been some sustained change, not quite as dramatic as what was happening during the games because um, I guess there was some criticism that it was potentially overdone and, and scared some people away from the um, private vehicles. Uh, the, the other legacy I'd like to see, um, you know, from the Commonwealth Games um, retained as well as so a support for um, new new improvements to public transport. So I think people are seeing like what the Gold Coast Lot Rail can do. They're, they've wanted um, subsequent stages as well. So that, that kind of just that ingrained behaviour or desire or acceptance of new modes. And and also on that, on the legacy part as well, um, I think it, it showcased uh, the Gold Coast and, you know, it, it is growing and people want to move there as well. So and invest in on the Gold Coast. So I'd, I'd like to see those legacies retained. Thanks, Tim. Thanks. And coming back to you, Nick, um, in your presentation, you talked about Burnley train station, which is um, here in Melbourne, not far from me. And I just wanted to ask you, how you what you talked about that, how typical is uh, Burnley 
uh, train station to other stations. Um, I think it's, and where does it sit on the scale of, um, and maybe give us some examples of other stations that you've come across that there's been, you know, common issues. Well, Burnley Station is really interesting because Australia Post is building their brand new head office right next to it. Um, but it's been neglected and I, I really can't explain to you how poorly it is as a, as a main train station, um, that there's no maintenance, the lighting, the pathways have got potholes, there's exposed grates. Um, seriously, the edge of the platform is actually worn down to the timber that was probably introduced 80 years ago. Um, but let me give you a practical example of to, if I wanted to go to the MCG, so my, my closest train station is Elstonwick train station. And when I get to the train station, it's got a ramp that goes down the platform. So I can wheel down the ramp to get to the platform to get on the train. But on the way back, I get off at Ripon Lee station because Ripon Lee station is flat. It's a little bit further away, but it's flat. Whereas if I went to Elstonwick station, I'd have to get someone to try and push me up the ramp to get out of Elstonwick station. So that's a simple application. I've got to use two different stations to go in different directions because they are easier to use. And I think that's one of the things that's quite frustrating. And to be honest, the political parties, the Disability Standards for Accessible Public Transport were enacted about 1994. So we've had close to um, 30 years to plan for transport accessibility and seamless accessibility. And we are still so far behind that um, there is so much work to be done on the infrastructure to make sure that accessible uh, tram stops and uh, buses, particularly coaches, uh, there's so few accessible coaches that are around to make our rolling stock more accessible. But um, I'll leave that argument for another day. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Nick. Uh, we might come back to that one in a minute as well. Um, uh, Tim, question for, for you that's coming from Andrew asking, in the report connecting SEQ 2031 document, the infrastructure for public transport upgrades are all very much in and out of the city, uh, nothing in the way of loops to allow movement across suburbs to allow for interconnection. In your view, why hasn't there been inv investment into loop lines to allow this? Yeah, the traditional investment in terms of the network in in those radial lines radiating out, particularly um, well, predominantly radiate, radiating out from the the Brisbane CBD, for example. Um, well, that's been you know the the main economic centre. It's where most of the jobs are. It also has very high cost parking as well. So a, a lot of other centres haven't had those parking restrictions or high cost parking. So it's been a very predictable um, journey to plan for. So a lot of investment has focused on there. In terms of those orbital routes as well, that there is, the orbital routes do exist, although they often haven't been given any speed and protection measures, like, you know, operating their own segregated right of way. Um, it is definitely, I think, something that needs to be improved. And, you know, we're talking about moving to that polycentric region. Um, you know, moving from one centre to the other needs to be more emphasised, in my opinion, as well. So, it, yeah, so not having to use, say, like the CBD as as a interchange. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. And Nick, you talked about, you know, that we've had 40 years or 30 to 40 years to address some of these issues. Um, maybe kicking off with you, just talk about some of the stakeholders that need to come together to bring about this change and to really shift the dial. Well, I was lucky enough to work on the Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast for about four years. And um, I think TMR did a great job of, of pulling together different modes of transport to get to venues and to really close the distances. And one of the one of the legacies out of that was I think the people from Gold Coast and Brisbane got used to walking distances. In that you you had two options. There was shuttle buses, there was low floor buses, but there was also the ability to walk a kilometre or two kilometres to get to and from a venue to a transport hub or something like that. And that's one of the legacies is that it actually mobilises people to say, you know what, we're going to leave half an hour early and we're going to walk. We'll make sure we take our backpack with our sandwiches and a drink bottle 
So it actually, it means that you actually can get people geared up for the games and get them mobile so that, so that they actually enjoy the walk. And, and we have buskers and we have showcase and sponsorships and we have the Olympic and Paralympic festivals and art, art festivals so that all these things actually form part of the distraction that is, is complements the sport. But it means that for, as a community, you can go to so many events that aren't even in an Olympic venue or a Paralympic venue. And it really allows you to walk and be mobile. And that's one of the legacies that we actually mobilise people from a health and wellbeing point of view as well. Thanks, Nick. And just staying with you, a question from Emma asking, in your experience, what has been best practice in addressing universal design solutions where there are competing accessibility needs? Thanks, Nick. Uh, look, the problem with accessibility in transport is it costs a lot of money and the solutions sometimes aren't simple. But once again, you've just got to do it. The, the fact that, that we know full well, and I did it as part of my presentation, that accessibility extends far beyond people who use wheelchairs um, in the, it, for young families and people like that. But it's really creating some priorities and building upon those priorities. I mean, the Gold Coast, the low floor rail system there is fantastic. And I used it quite a lot. It was terrific. So hopefully if we can extend that to meet the heavy rail and, and also provide the fast track um, buses between uh, Brisbane and the Gold Coast so that all of a sudden you've got express services and things like that so that you can really create um, smart systems to get around the place and maybe maybe um, transport that is, is more universal like um, small buses and things like that that are based on Uber but can be ride share so that we actually start using our networks and technology to, to get mode share um, mobilisation as well. Thanks, Nick. And I want to sort of finish on, on this theme. Um, obviously, the um, Brisbane Games are 10 years, 10 years away. And Tim, in your presentation, you talked about exploiting technology. And where I'm coming from here is, you know, in 10 years' time, we're now here, um, what the Games are actually going to look like um, in 10 years' time. Um, what do you think are the biggest trends that are emerging and what, how do you think they will equate to priorities for the Games in 2032? Um, Tim? Yeah, the, the changing landscape of, um, of, of transport technology. Um, the, the, the biggest trends at the moment, obviously, around you know, these emerging modes as well that we're seeing and then using technology to exploit them, whether it be, um, you know, uh, apps to you know to rideshare because that that has happened it um, at the moment um, whether it be use of e-scooters and other things like that other other technology improvements um, you know even things like um, improving uh, signal priority and everything for public transport you know it hasn't been um, you know, well developed, well used in um, Queensland, but maybe there's a potential for it going forward. Um, it could be used. Um, I guess the other thing about technology as well, it is it is uncertain, and um, and we need to keep up with it and think about how we can exploit it. Um, you know, if, if you look at other companies historically, you know, look at something like Kodak or others. Um, you know, they, they didn't keep ahead of the trends, and you know, they they disappeared as well. So, I think we need to think about that when we're we're looking and planning the system as well as to how we can use the technology that comes out. So, Nick, can I ask you for some closing uh, remarks on that theme and take your time? Look, I think a lot's been said today, but the one thing that we need is innovation. Is is the brilliant people on these calls who are engineers and scientists and, and people who have, who understand and have a great history of, of providing transport networks and is that we look at how we can be innovative. 10 years in technology is a long time. And it just means that we can maximize the resources, um, providing smart, smart technologies that mean that I can plan my journey down to the moment so that I know that I've got a seat and it's, it's easy to get to, and that the infrastructure we're providing is a legacy infrastructure that'll last another 50 years. And um, I think we need to really challenge people's thinking 
to say, well, how better can we can provide the transport for the games so that when the circus leaves town, um, is that we've improved southeast Queensland um, for the community because ultimately we're the ones that will be paying the bill for the games and we're the ones that can reap the rewards of the legacy. So innovation big time. Thank you. Thank you for that. And we might close on, on that uh, optimistic note. I want to especially thank Nick Morris and Tim Kupik for their time today and giving up their time. Just also apologies for our shaky start with the technology. I think we need some um, uh, future technology going forward. Uh, but I would like to very much thank Engineers Australia's industry partners, AMAG, Arab, Oricon, GHD, Cardno, Nasdantec, and SMEC for their support. Please, as always, we're looking for your feedback. If you could just take one minute to um, uh, fill in the, um, the feedback form, which is in the description box below. Thank you again for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you at future Thought Leaders sessions. Thank you and good afternoon. <laughs>